minutes, we will start calculus proper here. Last week, we did a lot of messing around with algebra. Let's introduce a major sort of idea of calculus, which we'll call the instantaneous of change. And I'm calling this a concept of calculus, but it's a concept we've all seen before. It's nothing actually new here in terms of the concept. And to see that, let's give a concrete example. Let's look at motion in a physical space. So I was saying that this is not a new concept and that I would give an example to illustrate that. Let's look. at a falling object. And in particular, let's look at the height of a falling object above the ground. So you drop a rock or off a cliff or something, and you look at its height. And we'll measure everything in meters, let's say we push an object off a cliff and its height above the ground after t seconds is given by h of t equals 10 minus 4.9 T squared. And we're interested in this instantaneous rate of change, this mysterious concept. Um, let's look at a concept from college algebra. So not a um, calculus concept. If we have a function we can define the average rate of change on an interval from A to B. And let's just briefly remind ourselves of the average rate of change formula. F of B minus F of A divided by B minus A. And let's relate the average rate of change back to the example on the previous frame. If we've got this function and we're calling it something other than f, so the average rate of change would be h of b minus h of a over b minus a, what does that represent? Well, these h's are height. Height is measured in meters. b and a are times. Time is measured in seconds. So the unit of the average rate of change is meters per second. 
In other words, this average rate of change is an average velocity. Meters per second is the units for velocity. And we can therefore ask questions like, between the moment the object was dropped and the moment it hit the ground, what is this falling object's average velocity? And we can answer that with this formula. But suppose we don't want that word average in there. Suppose we want to ask a question like, after 0 0.5 seconds, what is the object's velocity? Well, we're no longer asking for an average. We're asking what the velocity is at a specific instant. So the answer to this question is what we call the instantaneous rate of change Racer is being wonky. Oh, never mind. We'll just tolerate it. The uh, the instantaneous rate of change of this function h of t at t equals. 0 0.5. And finding instantaneous rates of change is a calculus problem. It's kind of the basis of what we call differential calculus, which we'll spend most of this semester talking about. Then in calculus two, we'll look at other branches of calculus. So how could we try to study, oops, how could we try to study an instantaneous rate of change? How to this? This is sort of a major idea that I'm now saying. Calculus works via approximation. We approximate the quantity we want, and then we make the approximation better and better until somehow it stops being an approximation and becomes the exact quantity that we're looking for. So from the question I just asked, how can we find the instantaneous velocity of this object? Let's pull back a little and ask, well, how could we approximate the velocity of this object after 0 0.5 seconds? And here's what sort of Newton and Leibniz, and I mean, those are the two people who sort of get credited for, for inventing calculus. Here's what they came up with. They were working independently, but they came up with the following idea. 
but they can spin a tiniest rate of change at some value, let's say x equals a, can be approximated using the average rate of a change on a small interval. A comma B. And let's think about this before we sort of blunder forward and start looking at an example. Why would this be true? Well, and let's ask that in the concrete example where we're looking at a falling object. Well, falling objects change in velocity over time. That's the process of acceleration. But acceleration itself takes time to happen. So if you just look at an object's velocity over one one billionth of a second, let's say, very little acceleration is happening during that time interval. The object's velocity is very close to just being constant. And if you take the average rate of change of a constant function, that should equal the value of the constant function, is kind of our logic here. If this interval is small enough, there is almost no acceleration. The object's velocity is almost constant, and the average velocity and the exact velocity are almost the same. How does that strike everybody as plausible? Does everybody sort of understand the idea behind this argument? If this strikes everybody as plausible, then we now have a numerical tool for estimating the answer to this question. We could estimate the answer as h of 0 0.5 minus h of b, all divided by 0 0.5 minus b. And um, we're not estimating that quantity, we're using that quantity as our estimation. And this word here, I mean, this interval has to be small for the estimation to be good. What that means concretely is that B should be close to point like 0.51 or 0 0.501 or something like that. 
before we proceed, we're going to give an alternate formula for the average rate of change. And it's not immediately, I think, going to be clear why we would want to do this, but it is going to turn out that in practice, this alternate form that we're looking at is going to be simpler to use than the form that we're giving. And I mean, I call it an alternate form to the, it's the exact same form to the, with a kind of variation. Suppose you have an interval three, three point one. You could rewrite this as the interval three comma three plus point one. I mean, 3.1 is three plus point one. And if you, in general, rewrite the interval from A to B as the interval from A to A plus H, then the average rate of change formula becomes F of A plus H minus f of a divided by a plus h minus a. And in the denominator, of course, cancellation occurs. We have an a, we have a negative a, Let's try this eraser a second time and see if it wants to cooperate. The A does not want to cooperate. No idea what's going on with our Zoom whiteboard at the moment. Sorry about this. Um, the the learning curve that comes from try having to master new technology. Never mind, I'll just scribble it out. This A and this minus A. Cancel each other out and we're left with that as an average rate of change formula. F of A plus H minus F of A all divided by H. Let's come back to this problem. Let's try to estimate the velocity of this falling object after 0.5 seconds. We're going to look at an interval starting at the value we're interested in. So starting at 0.5, and ending at 0 0.5 plus h. And if the average rate of change is going to give us a good approximation, that interval has to be small. If this interval is small, what's that say about H? 
H has to be small too, which we can maybe try to formalize a little. H has to be close to zero. The average rate of change is H. Oh, this is this is uh, so ugly because I'm using H for the height function and I'm using H as this letter that has to be close to zero. Let me fix that. I am going to just rename the height function as F. so that I'm no longer in this awkward situation where H is being used in two different ways in the same problem. You can scribble that out in your notes as well. So the average rate of change on this interval is F, of 0 0.5 plus H minus F of 0 0.5 all divided by H. That is my approximation of the instantaneous velocity at point five. And this approximation is good as long as H is close to zero. And now I am going to, assuming here we are. So here is Desmos dot. Um, and here's the height function we're looking at. It's already pre-entered before class. F of X equals 10 minus 4.9 X squared. And here is um, F of 0 0.5 plus H minus F of 0 0.5 all divided by H. So here's the quantity I said would approximate our velocity at 0 0.5 seconds. And currently there's one entry in that table. I have H equals one. But I said that for this approximation to be good, H should be close to zero. And I don't know that one is really that close to zero. So maybe let's try another entry. Maybe let's look at 0 0.1. Our approximation for the velocity of this object is negative five point three nine meters per second. Is everybody buying this so far? Does anybody have questions about what we're doing or why we're doing it? Is this approximation a good approximation? That's kind of a vague question. We've already said, let me, if I'm capable of doing it, let me go back to the whiteboard. Let's see if I 
was hoping with the finer motor controls of this mouse, I'd be able to fix this, but I think it's just staying this way for the rest of the lesson. Um, but anyway, I say that this is a good approximation as long as this is a small interval, as long as H is close to zero. Let me now make an emphatic statement. The closer H is to, to zero, the better the approximation. So going back to desmos.com, new share back to desmos. The question of is this a good approximation is kind of muddy, but the approximation we have here, negative, negative point, um, sorry, I'm struggling with technology a bit, negative 5.39 meters per second, is at the very least a better approximation than a negative 9.8 meters per second. Because this number, 0 0.1, is closer to zero than this number. And if we wanted an even better approximation, we could pick a smaller value of H. And the closer H gets to zero, the better this approximation becomes. And Assuming that this approximation is getting good, which I promise it is, it looks like the velocity at um, 0 0.5 is about negative 4.9 meters per second. Now I've said, that the closer H gets to being zero, the better this approximation becomes, which then sort of raises a natural question. Why don't we just let H be zero? But we can't let H be zero. Because if we go back to this expression, we're dividing by H. If H equaled zero, we'd get a division by zero error. So we want H to be close to zero, but we can't let H actually be zero. Because if H were zero, we would get this error. And that it gives us the concept of the limit, which we're going to spend, oh, I don't know, maybe two weeks or so we're talking about. For now, though, the limit will be the next section. Let's keep messing around with this instantaneous rate of change. New share, let's get this white four back. We've approximated 
the instantaneous rate of change using Desmos.com and a table, can we look at this algebraically? And okay, this is going to be a little messy maybe, but let's have a go at it. Let's remind ourselves, first of all, what this function is. 10 minus 4.9 T squared. And we're looking, I rename this as F. And we're looking at F of 0 0.5 plus H minus F of 0 0.5 divided by H. And we're asking the question, what happens as H gets closer and closer to zero? And the answer is that it's hard to tell. I mean, as H is getting closer and closer to zero, the numerator is getting closer and closer to zero, and the denominator is getting closer and closer to zero. So this whole fraction is getting closer and closer to zero divided by zero, which is nothing. If you plug that into your calculator, you'd get an error message spit out at you. So looking at this fraction, it's not at all obvious what happens. Well, here's where what we did last week is going to sort of come back. You might remember that last week we spent quite some time messing around with expressions that look like this, f of something plus h. At the moment, it's not clear what happens as h approaches zero. Let's try simplifying this expression and see if we can cancel some H's and maybe make it easier to work with. And I'm just going to to take this one step at a time. I really wish I could erase stuff, um, but it's fine. We can just go to a new, a new frame. Okay, so let's just take this step by step. If we're going to look at this expression, we need to know what f of 0 0.5 plus h is. Going back to this stuff we did, in class and then again in the quiz, f of 0 0.5 plus h is 10 minus 4.9 times 0 
five plus h squared. So zero point five plus h times zero point five plus h. So ten minus four point nine. And let's try to FOIL this. 0.5 times 0.5 should be 0.25. 0.5H and another 0.5H should be H. And then you have an H squared. And I'm going to, does anybody have, I see some people do have a calculator out. So we have a 10 minus 4.9 times 25. Can somebody get that for me? Seven seven five. Thank you. And then this four point nine continues to distribute. We've got negative four point nine times H. And we've got negative four point nine. times H squared. So that's F of 0.5 plus H. We're going to need F of 0.5. Now F of 0.5 is um. You can plug this into your calculator to verify it, but F of 0.5 is 10 minus 4.9.5 squared is 0.25. So F of 0.5 is exactly this. It's 8.775. So, F of 0 0.5 plus H minus F of 0 0.5 all divided by H equals this expression. This is the first term. And let me copy this over. Minus F of point five. All divided by H. Ah, a bit of a scramble, but the finish line is in sight. What sort of simplification occurs now? That the 0.775 will cancel out. That's correct, thank you. We've got a positive 8.775 and a negative. 8.775. And what can we do now? We can factor out an H. Again, exactly correct. Thank you. Come on. 
So we're factoring an H out in the numerator. And now you see this H and this H cancel. And we're left with negative 4.9 minus 4.9 times H. And we're asking what happens. We haven't sort of formally uh, defined this, but we're asking what happens as H approaches zero. Well, anything times zero is zero and anything times something close to zero is close to zero. So as H is getting closer and closer to zero, 4.9 times H is also getting closer and closer to zero. And it looks like the answer should be negative 4.9. And if you remember, let's go back to Desmos. When we let H be very small, this is indeed very close to negative 4.9. And that's the idea of finding an instantaneous rate of change. And again, I promise that we're not going to spend the entire class period doing, I mean, the entire semester doing this. It would get very tedious very quickly. We will learn quicker ways of finding instantaneous rates of change. But that will come in time. Right now, we have seven minutes left. Let's look at something, and by us, I mean you. Let's have you look at something simpler. Say f of x equals x squared. Let's see if you can use the process we just went through to find the instantaneous rate of change. at x equals three. So we're going to look at f of three plus h minus f of three divided by h. We're going to um, simplify this. We're going to cancel everything that cancels, and we're going to try to answer the question, what happens as H approaches zero? And I will 